We read from the Word of God this morning as we find it in 2 Corinthians 13. 2 Corinthians 13. And the specific reason for the selection of this passage of Scripture for this morning is because as we deal with the subject of the Trinity, the three persons are by implication spoken of in what's called the apostolic blessing. And that's recorded in the 14th verse of this chapter. 2 Corinthians 13. This is the third time that I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present, the second time, and being absent now I write to them which heretofore have sinned, and to all other, that if I come again, I will not spare. Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we are also we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should not do that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and ye are strong, and this also we wish, even your perfection. Therefore I write these things, being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness, according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification, and not to destruction. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with an holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So far we read from God's word. As I noted, the apostolic blessing in that 14th verse, the grace of, our Lord, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all, is one of the proof texts for the Trinity. We deal with that in Lord's Day, 20, Lord's Day 8, Lord's Day 8 of the Heidelberg Catechism this morning. How are these articles, that is, the articles of the Apostles' Creed, to be divided? Into three parts. The first is of God the Father and our creation. The second, of God the Son and our redemption. The third, of God the Holy Ghost and our sanctification. Since there is but one only divine essence. Why speakest thou of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Because God so hath so revealed himself in his word that these three distinct persons are the one, only, true, and eternal God. we deal with something that's very profound beyond our 
ability, even when we exercise our faith in that which God reveals in his word. Now remember how we define faith according to Lord's Day 7. We hold for truth what he has revealed in his word. We're going to hold it for truth. It's not whether we get it. It's beyond our ability to comprehend. We can only conceive of one being and one person. That's what we are. That's what we see all about us. But the Bible says of God that he is three persons in one being. That we can't get. But it's, again, not whether we can get it. It's whether God says that that's the case. Do we get that? And so that answer, the first part of the answer to the 25th question, because God has so revealed himself in his word. That's the way he's revealed himself. That's the way we're going to take it. If he says so, then we bow. And we say, right, good. And we trust that to be true. When we get to our last point and we deal with the significance of this doctrine of the Trinity, let's just be aware of where we're going to go. The doctrine of the Trinity teaches us that God is a living God. He's alive. And we'll explain why we say that, but that's first. The Trinity implies clearly that God is a living God. And so when we make our confessions, we say the one true living God. He's alive. The second thing we're going to see is that God has relationships relationships within himself which he demonstrates to us when in salvation he takes us into a relationship with himself that's just like the relationship he has within himself. And we're going to find that in the body of those saved, we are many members in one body, three persons in one being, many persons, one body in Him, three in one. I believe in the triune, triune, three, one. God. First of all, the object of our faith. We believe. I believe. I have faith. The object of our faith. The basis for our faith. Or literal, more literally, the scriptural basis for our faith. And then thirdly, the significance of this faith. One, the object of our faith. That is God. God is the object of our faith. In Hebrews 11, verse 6, in powerful statement at the very beginning, without faith it is impossible to please him. But then this, he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Must believe that he is. I believe in God. He is. Our knowledge of him, and this is, this is very interesting, but very important, our knowledge of him 
comes from him. We don't learn about him from other sources. We learn about God from him, from his revelation of himself. That's first. The Christian, the God of the Christian faith is unique. And it's unique because we learn of him from himself. Very interesting. This last issue of the Standard Bear has an article by Reverend Clayton Spronk. He deals, first of all, with his experience with his children at the zoo, but then secondly, he deals with the subject of the Quran and the Bible. And that, in that last part of that article that deals with the Bible and the Quran, very interesting. The grasp that we have about the Bible is the same as the grasp we have about God. God is going to tell us about himself, and he's going to tell about himself in his infallibly inspired word. God does that for us. The God we believe in is the God of the scriptures who defines and describes himself. All the other gods that the world of unbelief has is going to be a God of their imagination or the God of a man's imagination, not the God of the Bible. But even as we say that, the second thing that's unique is this God that is the true living God is beyond us. Well, that shouldn't be hard for us to take. He's God. And again, that name God, he possesses every perfection. We may have a, a minuscule amount of evidence of some of God's communicable attributes. Just a tiny part. God has them infinitely. You can't measure how much he has them. He's going to be beyond our ability to comprehend him. And that's okay. That's okay. So that's how we're going to start. What does the Bible say? That's what we're going to believe. What does the Bible say about God? He's going to reveal himself to us. And at the very same time, he's going to be beyond our ability to conceive of him. And again, that little verse out of Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, that all of us know, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on thine own understanding. We want to grasp but we don't have to limit God to what we can get. The doctrine of the Trinity is summarized in seven statements. One, there is only one God. Two, in God there are three persons, three that say, I. Three, God the Father is God. Four, God the Son is God. Five, God the Holy Spirit is equally God. Six, there are not three gods, there's one God. And seven, those three God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are co-eternal and co-equal. Co-eternal and co-equal. There are three creeds, three ecumenical creeds that are now included in the back of the Psalter. On pages 81 and following. The Nicene Creed, the Chalcedon Creed, the Athanasian Creed, and the Chalcedon Creed. These three creeds, Nicene Creed on page 81, Athanasian Creed on pages 82, 83, and the top of 84, and the Creed of Chalcedon on the bottom of page 84 and the top of page 85. Those three creeds, are what the church of Jesus Christ 
has stated as a summary of what Scripture teaches. Maybe this afternoon would be a good time to read the introduction, some of the history, and then to go through them and just see how they reflect what Scripture says about God. Or another way to say it, what they see, how God tells us about himself. What can we say about God? That God is one. That one true living God. There's unity in him. There's obviously plurality of persons, but the plurality of persons does not deny or contradict, in spite of what we grasp, the unity of God, the oneness of God. The persons in God are not called gods. They dwell in communion and in relationship with each other without confusion. Each person is not a part of God or a kind of God. And in spite of our concepts of Father's Son, there's no subordination in God. We always say the first is God the Father. Second, God the Son. Third, God the Holy Spirit. We often make God the Son a little bit lower than God the Father. And instead of listing them in an order that goes down, we probably ought to better list them in a horizontal line. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Just as a simple way to make sure we hold for that fact no subordination in God. All three equally God. Co-equal, co-eternal. Equal in deity. Equal in dignity. Equal in power. Equal in glory. And... The names that the Bible, God himself, gives to each one of the three persons makes them distinct from each other. They're not identical persons. Not part God, part, part, so there's three parts like a pie cut into three pieces. No, all God. But while all God... The names that God gives to each, God himself gives to himself, describes their unique features. God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Spirit or Holy Breath. What does it take to be Father? You perform an act of love whereby you reproduce yourself in another. To beget. A father begets. That's what makes him a father. Otherwise, he's just a man. But God the Father says that father is performing the activity of love, of reproducing himself in another. And this goes beyond us. It's always, it's not one and it's done. It's a constant activity inside God that that's the activity of the Father. God the Son, what does it mean to be a son? I have been begotten by a father. Now we say it just the way I just said it. It's, an, it's an, an activity of the past. Just a few years ago, my dad did it. 
I'm the product of that activity of my father. In the Trinity, God the Son is constantly, eternally begotten of the Father. The object of an activity of love, reproducing himself in another. Never did it start. Never will it end. But it's true. That's the name. God the Holy Breath, the Holy Spirit, speaks of an activity of breathing. Breathing forth proceeds from the Father and the Son. Eternally. Activity. Activity. Activity implies life. God the Father, the name, God the Son, the name, God the Holy Spirit, speaks of their individual, distinct, personal activities. And the, name, the names show their relationship to each other. The very name, Father, Son, Holy Breath, speaks of their relationship to each other. Their mode of action and the effects of their activity. We stop there because we're limited by ability and by time. But that's the object of our faith. Three in one. Three persons, one being, one essence. What's the biblical basis? Because we can't just make this up. This has to be what God says about himself. The activity of God that the revelation that God gives about himself is not something that we find in a couple of verses and it sets it forth, and there it is. Because the Bible is not a dogmatics. The Bible, you can get a dogmatics and you get a chapter on the Trinity. The Bible is a historical revelation. God revealed himself over the period of time in history. And as a result of that historical revelation of himself, there's a progress in his revelation. So you find in, in, Second Corinthians, I'm sorry, in Hebrews 1 that in sundry times and in divers manners God revealed himself in the past. But now he's revealed himself in Christ. Well, so it is with the doctrine of the Trinity. The revelation that God gives of himself in the Bible is a progressive revelation. And first, and amazingly, right away in the very first three chapters of the Bible, we have references to the fact that inside God, there is more than one person. There's more than one person. So even the children know that when God created man on the sixth day, God stopped and he said, let us make man in our image. Not let me make man in my image, but let us make man in our image. And after man fell into sin in chapter 3, God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us. He's become as one of us. But now, while that revelation of God shows a plurality of persons, we still don't know how many. But again, very, very early in history, in Deuteronomy 6, 
but is quoted in, De in Mark 12 in the summary of the law, which is the first commandment. Then Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, 6 verse 4. Jehovah, our God, is one Jehovah. One Jehovah. And from the fact that there is only one flows the duty of love to him. I don't divide my love. My love is to him with my all because there's only one Jehovah, one God. There's a verse in Isaiah 44. It's verse 6 that shows that oneness of God too. Thus saith Jehovah, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I, I am the first and I am the last and beside me there is no God. I, I am the first, I am the last, beside me there is no God. Very clear. Same thing comes out in 1 Timothy 1, verse 17. But then, when Jesus ascended into heaven, that's when we have the first indication of the fact that there are three in God. Because when he ascended, he gave what we call the baptism formula. The baptism formula. I baptize thee in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Well, we don't make that up. Jesus gave that to us. So Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Go ye therefore and teach the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. There's the three. And the identification of the three, Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And then there's that implication just to also now in that apostolic benediction. Second Timothy, Second Corinthians, verse 13, verse 14. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. The three persons are distinct. A father does something. A son does something. A spirit does something. They're distinct. Each person has their own characteristics. That, that the father is God is hardly challenged in the history of the Christian church. But a good proof for it is in John 6. John 6, verse 27. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed, sealed. For him hath God the Father sealed. The same thing is in Titus 1 verse 4. God the Father identifies him, the first person, as divine. What about the second? In Romans chapter 9, verse 5, the Apostle Paul is grieving about his fellow Jews. And then he speaks of them this way in verse 5. Whose are the fathers, and of whom concerning the flesh Christ came? Listen, Romans 9, verse 5. Who is over all God? Christ came, who is over all God, blessed forever. Amen. Jesus is God, the Son. The familiar words of John 1, 
verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And that Word, verse 14 says, was made flesh and dwelt among us. When Thomas saw Jesus for the first time, and his fellow disciples had said to him, we saw him. And he said, I don't believe you until I put my finger into the holes in his wrists, in his hands, and put my hand into the hole in his side. Then the next Sunday, there was Jesus in that room. And he said it to Thomas. You said it, do it. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. John 20, verse 28. My God. Again, God is giving, him, revealing himself in his own word. His revelation is telling us about him. There's many other references that I could give. But now the Spirit. What about God the Spirit? There is the historical event in Acts chapter 5 of Ananias and Sapphira. They lied. They didn't have to. They could have kept back part of what they paid, but they wanted to be able to have the honor that Barnabas had at the end of chapter 4. So Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost. That's verse 3. And to keep back part of the price of the land. Whiles it remained, was it not thine? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied to man, but to... He just said Holy Ghost. But now he says, to God. You've not lied to man. You've lied to God. And in my Bible, I took a little pencil mark and I wrote a, a circled Holy Ghost in verse 3 and then God in verse 4 and I drew a line. The Holy Ghost is God. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit off... Wait a minute. Did you catch that? The virtue of eternity. The virtue of eternity. It belongs to God. That's an incommunicable attribute of God. Eternity. Is used with regard to the spirit. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The eternal spirit. He's God. 1 Corinthians 3 and 1 Corinthians 6 also use passages that imply the deity of that third person of the Trinity. And it was the Spirit who effected the conception, the Spirit of God shall come upon you, the power of the highest shall overshadow you, Mary, and that thing which shall be conceived in you shall be called the Son of God. That work of conception by the Spirit, God the Spirit, is that which would produce the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. These three persons identified in these various passages as God, equal in deity, equal in that they are God, co-equal, are yet one being, agreeing in perfect harmony, 
and working in all things harmoniously. That's why sometimes we have to be careful when we read that answer of the 24th question in the Catechism. God the Father in our creation, God the Son in our redemption, God the Holy Spirit in our sanctification. Now, if you go through the articles of the Apostles' Creed, there they put God the Father first, and then they deal with all the works of creation. And then with Jesus Christ, they deal with all the works of redemption. And the Holy Spirit, they deal with the works of sanctification. That's why they make that division. But, Gen but Genesis 1, by the word of the Lord, Psalm 33 says, were the host of them made. God and God the Father and God the Son, Jesus, in the beginning was the Word. The Word, by Him were all things made. John 1 verse 3. And the Spirit, all things were by the breath of His mouth. Psalm 33 verse 9. All three persons were present in the work of creating. All three are there in the work of redemption. And all three are there in the work of, re of sanctification. This is a mystery in the sense that it's beyond all human understanding. But it's not a contradiction. It's incomprehensible. It's beyond us and our ability to comprehend. But it does not make it untrue nor does it make it impossible. <clears throat> Paul prays for the Ephesians that they would know the love of God which passeth knowledge. We delight in that love that passes our ability to get it. And we hold it to be true. It's not whether we can get it comprehend it, but all we need to do is to see that the Bible teaches it. The Bible teaches it, it's true. And I'll wait to get all the explanation and the answers until I'm in glory with him. Then I'll get it. What's the importance of this? One, as we already implied, God is a living God, that there is activity in God. He's not dead. He, he's not a Buddha that sits there as an idol that's covered with gold or some other God. He is a living God. He's alive. And that life that he has within himself that's implied in the activity, begetting, being begotten, breathing forth, that life is really what salvation, our regenerated hearts, possesses. We are given to be born from the earth, Nicodemus says, must I be born in my mother's womb again? No, you've got to be born from above. Not just again, but from above. And when the Spirit, God the Spirit, performs that work inside us, He gives us life. And that life is of such a nature that we are Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto the obedience, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Then this, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. 
we're begotten of the Father. Now that goes beyond what we would dare to say, but there's a spiritual begetting, an activity of love whereby God reproduces himself in us. And so he predestinates us to the, be conformed to the image of his Son. You have the name that, that you just kind of take for granted now, but what an amazing name. You have the title Child of God. That's the most honorable thing that could ever be said of any one of us. Don't make sport accomplishments. Don't make academic accomplishments. Don't make employment and work accomplishments your identity. They're nothing. They're dust. They're going to all burn up. But the name that you have that no one can take from you forever, child of God, the living God gives you life so that if you believe in God's only begotten Son, you shall not only not perish, but you shall have everlasting life. You're going to live forever. Death doesn't stop your life. It opens up a new door so that you sin no more. It ends that. It ends sin. But you live on. You are a child of God with his life inside you. Second significance is that whole concept of the relationships that we have with each other. The living, loving relationship inside God. Just think of love. It says, the John, 1 John 4, 8, God is love. Now, to love implies a subject and an object. If there weren't three in God, but only one in God, he would need something outside of himself to love. But because there are three in God, and the relationship is one of perfect harmony and love, God is love. And when he begets us unto a lively hope, a living hope, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, then his oneness means that there's no conflict and no strife in him, but only perfect fellowship. And the salvation that he gives to us is that he who enjoys that perfect, harmonious life of friendship draws us into that same relationship with him. When we turn our back to him, we don't see that that face shining. That's what the word sin means. We aim at the wrong target. We're, we got our back in the wrong way. We turn around. He turns us, and we shall be turned. And then we see that face of God. And nothing has changed. His relationship never slipped, never wavered, never waned. It always burned hot and fervent toward us. And he who lives in that rich, harmonious fellowship and relationship within himself draws us into that same relationship with him. And we constantly, we consciously experience that in our relationship with each other. As he is, so are we to be. Christ is our head, and we have a relationship with him, every member of the body, but all the members of the body have a, have a relationship with each other here too. Salvation makes us one. Salvation makes many members in one body, even as the Trinity is one. Jesus said that. 
This is very, very interesting. John 17, he's about ready to stop his sacerdotal prayer. The whole chapter is his prayer. Neither pray I for my disciples, though these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The world of unbelievers, when they witness the miracle, what to them is unbelievable, harmony of relationship. The ability to forgive and still love. That's beyond them. When they see us so different and yet so together in the family of Jesus Christ, then they have proof that somebody only sent from God could do that kind of a work to make us one. When you open your mouth before the world to gossip and slander about a fellow believer, you deny and destroy the prayer of Jesus Christ. John 17, verse 21. Read it every week. Amen. Our Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word. It enables us to say and to hear things that we wouldn't dare on our own. But Thy Word is powerful, rich, and we trust it. We believe it. Thou hast given us the faith to believe it. We thank Thee so that we dare to be, identify ourselves as children of Thee, the living God. We're alive, really alive, with a life that nothing on this earth can destroy. Thanks. Amen.